Hello and welcome to the appendicular skeleton. So remember the appendicular skeleton includes the two girdles, the pectoral girdle and the pelvic girdle. And then the pectoral girdle includes the arms and the hands. And that's what we're going to be covering today is the pectoral girdle and the upper limb. So if you look at that, it looks something like this. And we're going to start with the pectoral girdle. The pectoral girdle is composed of two bones. There are these, which are the clavicles, sometimes called collar bones. And there are these, which are the scapulae, sometimes called shoulder blades. And if you notice, it makes sort of a complete circle around the top. And that is what the uh, upper appendage is attached to. So this is the pectoral girdle. So we're going to look at these individually. So let's look at the clavicle first. So here's the clavicle. And if you look at the clavicle, remember it is a flat bone. If you take it out and look at it, it looks like this. And there really isn't much that I'm going to request that you know about the clavicle. But before we talk about it, look at it. You can see that the two ends of this bone are quite different from each other. One end looks like it was just sort of sawed off and it's straight across. The other end, though, is sort of flattened. So the end that is sort of flattened is the acromial end, and it's going to attach to the scapula. The end that is sort of sawed off is the sternal end, and it's going to attach to the sternum. There's one more thing that I want you to know about this bone. If near the acromial end, you're going to find a bump, and this bump is called the conoid tubercle. So you can see the conoid tubercle. That's all you have to know about the clavicle. This is the picture that's in your lab book, and it's quite good, I think. The other bone of the pectoral girdle is this one. It's the scapula. And so again, they're sort of blade-shaped, and so they're sometimes called shoulder blades. Well, when you look at them, they're not easy. They're quite different from the other, and they look very, very different depending on which view you look at it. This is a posterior view, and the posterior view has a big heavy ridge that runs right across it. If you put your hand up back behind your shoulder like this, you can feel it. It runs from your spine up to your shoulder. And so when we look at that, we're going to uh, use that is to define some things. Well, if you follow it all the way out to the end, you get to something that looks like this. It sort of looks like a tongue depressor. This is right on the tip of your shoulder, and it's called the acromion process. The rest of this structure is just called the scapular spine. Well, if you look above the spine, you're going to find a depression. And the word for depression is fossa. So this is above the spine fossa. So, so it's called the supraspinous fossa. Supra means superior, spinous fossa. There's also a much larger depression beneath this scapular spine. And so this one is beneath the spine fossa. This is the infraspinous fossa. Another thing about this bone is it has edges to it. And so you can see these edges. Sometimes edges are called margins. Sometimes they're called borders. Well, this one is near the armpit. If you put your hand inside your armpit, this is called the axilla. So sometimes this is called the axillary border. But it's also on the lateral side. So it's also called the lateral border. There's also a border on the other side. This one faces your vertebrae. So it's sometimes called the vertebral border. But it's also medial. Remember, medial means closer to the midline. So this is also called the medial border. So if you look at the posterior scapula, these are the things that you can see. If you flip it around, we're going to see other things. So here's the book picture that's in your lab book. And if you look here at the very top, you'll see not only the acromion and, and all that, but you'll see what's called the suprascapular notch. And so uh, a set of nerves and tendons run through there. Well, 
You can't see that very well on this other picture, but you can see it a little bit. There's the suprascapular notch. If we look at the anterior view, this is the view, this is the side of the bone facing the ribs, and it's very smooth. And then if you look at it, we're going to see all the same structures we already learned. Like if you look at this, that's still the acromion. We can't see the scapular spine anymore. We can't see the supra or infraspinous fossae. There are now some new things we can see. One of the things we can see is near the acromion process, and it looks like a little flat sort of cup. This is called the glenoid cavity, and this is where the head of your uh, humerus fits. And the humerus is the bone in your upper arm. So this is part of the shoulder socket. So is the acromion. And then there's a third part to the shoulder socket, and that's this. Well, if you turn this bone a certain way, this looks very much like a crow's head. And so believe it or not, that's what it's called. It's called the coracoid process. Coracoid is Latin for crow. So those three things make up the shoulder socket. We can also see a much larger depression on this side. Well, this is beneath the scapula. And the word for beneath or below, remember, is sub. And so this is the subscapular fossa. We already know that there are borders, but we also have angles. So there's an angle right here. This angle is up at the top, so it's called the superior angle. There's also an angle here, which is the inferior angle. And so again, those are the things on the anterior scapula. And here's the picture that's in your lab book. And again, it's a pretty good picture. So if we review, there's a posterior scapula. We have the acromion, the spine, the supraspinous, the infraspinous fossae. We have the two borders, lateral and medial. And if we flip it back over, we're going to see these things, the acromion, the glenoid cavity, the coracoid process. Remember, that's your shoulder socket. And then this large fossa, the infraspinous fossa, and then the superior angle and inferior angle. So you should practice those things. If you look at the scapula from a lateral view, there's the shoulder socket right there. And again, you can see these three things, the acromion, the glenoid cavity, and the coracoid process. You can also see the fossae very well. And if you look at this one on the far right, uh, this sort of Y-shaped looking thing, you can see where these three fossae are. So the superior uh, is the supraspinous fossa, inferior is the infraspinous fossa, and beneath again, is subscapular fossa. Let's look at the bones of the upper limb. There's only one, and it's called the humerus. So this is the humerus. Well, the humerus is a long bone. We've already talked about what long bones are like. Remember, they have a diaphysis. They have two epiphyses. If you cut open the diaphysis, you have the medullary cavity. We already know all that. So, when we look at it, we're going to have two epiphyses, a proximal and a distal. Well, the proximal is the one that attaches to your shoulder. And there's sort of a, a ball shape here. And it looks like a, a ping pong ball that's been cut in half. That is just called the head. If you look at the edge of this, it looks like a ping pong ball cut in half. Right where it was cut is called the anatomical neck. A neck is where a bone gets smaller, like the neck that we have below our own head. But this bone has two necks. It has this one, the anatomical neck, but it also has one down here where it gets skinny. This is the surgical neck. If you look down at the other end, what you're going to see is a fairly complicated bone. And depending on if you're looking anterior or posterior, it's going to look very different. 
If you look posterior down here, what you're going to see is a fairly deep fossa. Remember, a fossa is a depression. And that deep depression is where something called the olecranon fits. So it's called the olecranon fossa. If you look on either side of this, you're going to see things that stick out like wings. Well, these are bumps, and bumps are often called condyles. But these are bumps on top of bumps. Remember the prefix for on top of is epi. So these aren't just condyles, they're epicondyles. And so we have one on the same side as the head, and we have one on the opposite side of the head. The head is medial, so the opposite side is lateral. So this is the lateral epicondyle, and this is the medial epicondyle. If we flip this bone over, look, it looks very different. Again, we can still see the head up there, and we can still see the anatomical neck and the surgical neck. But what's most obvious now are these two bumps. There's a big bump and a small bump. The big bump is called the greater tubercle. And the smaller bump is called the lesser tubercle. And if you look right between the two tubercles, you're going to see a groove. This is called the intertubercular groove, or sometimes sulcus. So there's three things right there. They're on the opposite side is the head. The head is medial, so these are lateral. And then if you grab the bone and just feel it right along here, it feels very, very rough. There's a rough surface right here. Rough surfaces on bones are often called tuberosities. And a lot of times that's where muscles attach. And the muscle that attaches here is the deltoid muscle. So this is called the deltoid tuberosity. If you look at the distal end, you're going to see a complicated shape down here. And you're going to see, we already know the condyle, epicondyles, but there's two condyles now. But remember, these are our epicondyles. That one's medial, and this one's lateral. But there's also these condyles. And when you look at the two condyles, one of them is hourglass shaped or pulley shaped. And the other one is like round, like a little head or a little skull. The hourglass shaped one also looks like a pulley. It's called the trochlea. And that's the Latin word for pulley. Now, it's not just that middle part where it gets skinny. It looks like an hourglass. An hourglass has a wide part, skinny part, wide part. And then there's, but on the lateral side of that, there's a round one. And again, it looks a little bit like a skull or a head. Well, the head of something is often called the capital. And so this is called the capitulum. So that's the anterior humerus. If we flip it back over and look at it, we're going to see those again. But if you look at this, this shows the proximal end, and it shows all of those structures. And if you flip this bone back and forth, back and forth, you can see the head, <laughs> the anatomical neck. And then when you turn it around to the other side, you can see the greater tubercle, the lesser tubercle, and the intertubercular groove. And then where it gets skinny, you can see the surgical neck. Same thing down on the other end. If you flip it back and forth, back and forth, on the posterior side, there's this deep depression. That's the olecranon fossa. We can see these two epicondyles. If you flip it and look at it anterior, we're going to see the thing that looks like a pulley or an hourglass. That's the trochlea. And the round thing that looks like a little head or a skull. That's the capitulum. So, if you review, here's the anterior side, there's the 
greater and lesser tubercle, the intertubercular groove. There's our deltoid tuberosity down here, the two epicondyles. And the hourglass shape, the trochlea, and the round shape, the capitulum. That's anterior. If you turn it over and posterior, you can't see those anymore. We can still see the head, the anatomical neck, the surgical neck, but now you can't see those two, two tubercles. And if you look down at the other end, there's the olecranon fossa. There's our two epicondyles. So that's the posterior humerus. So that was the upper limb. If you look in the lower limb, what you're going to see are two bones. Two bones. One of them is medial and one of them is lateral. So remember this is anatomical position. In anatomical position, the little fingers are next to the thigh. Well, the bone that's on the little finger side is called the ulna. The bone that's on the thumb side, which we'll get to a little bit later, is the radius. But we're going to look at the ulna first. So again, this is a long bone. So we have a diaphysis. We have two epiphyses. If you look at the proximal epiphysis, it's the bigger one. And it's got a U shape in it right here. So U kind of means ulna. So this bone a little bit tells you what it is. Now if you look at the most proximal part of this bone, it sticks up. That's the point on your elbow. So if you think about your elbow right here, this point, that is this, and it's called the olecranon process. The olecranon process fits into the olecranon fossa on the humerus. And then we have this U-shape, and that's the trochlear notch. And the trochlea of the humerus fits in this notch. And then we have this one that sticks out like a lip, sort of, or a thumb-like thing. That is the coronoid process. Well, these three parts right here are going to fit around the trochlea and create a joint. If we look at the distal end, there's two parts down here. There's a, little, a head, which is round, and then there's a little finger-like projection that sticks down. The finger-like projection looks a little bit like a stylus. And so it's called the styloid process. So we have a head and we have a styloid process of the ulna. That's all there is to the ulna. The other bone in the lower arm is this one, which is on the thumb side. And it's the radius. The reason it is called that because when you turn your hand like this, that bone radiates. It crosses. Well, when you look at the radius, it's not very complicated. One end looks like a golf tee, and the other end is bigger. Well, usually the bigger end is the proximal end, but this bone is backwards. This is the proximal end, and this is the thing that looks like a golf tee, and it's just called a head. And then you're going to have a little neck, and then you're going to have a bump, and the bump is rough. Remember, rough things are often called tuberosities, and that's what this is. It's the radial tuberosity. At the other end, there's another writing instrument, another stylus. So we have another styloid process. So when you say styloid process, you have to say styloid process of the ulna or styloid process of the radius. So here's the ulna again. Remember, that's the olecranon process. There's our trochlear notch coronoid process. Down at the other end we have the head and we have the styloid process of the ulna. And then our radius, which looks like this. There's the ulna. This is how those two fit together. 
And that's how they fit with the humerus. So if you look at this, this is in your lab book. You can see the electronon process. There's the um, head of the radius. Look, they don't match up at the top. They do match up kind of at the bottom. But at the top, they don't because they fit like this against this bone. And if you look at the distal end, you're going to see the styloid process of the radius and the styloid process of the ulna. If you look here, you can look how they fit with the hand. So you can see the styloid process of the radius. That's number one on this picture. And the styloid process of the ulna, that's number 14 on this picture. And look how they fit together to create sort of a concavity where the hand fits. So let's look at the hand. Well, when you look at it, it's obvious that the bones are different. And there are three sets of bones in the hand. There are these, which are short bones, and these are called the carpals. There are eight carpals. And then there are these, which are called metacarpals. These are the bones of the palm of your hand. And there are five of these. And then there are these, which are bones of your fingers, these are called phalanges. Each one is a phalanx, and if you count them, there are 14 of these. So if you go back, 8 plus 5 plus 14 equals 27. So there are 27 bones in each hand. Well, I'm not going to learn a whole lot about these bones. There are markings on here. You can see bumps and you can see concavities and so on. But what we're going to learn in the hand is just the names of these bones. Let's look at the easier ones first. So the easier ones are the metacarpals and phalanges. If you look at the metacarpals, remember there are five of them. And they could not be named any easier. They're just named 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But you have to start with the thumb. You have to start with a pollux. The phalanges are also really, really, really easy. If you look at each finger, there are three phalanges. Remember, singular is phalanx. So there's a proximal phalanx, a middle phalanx, and a distal phalanx on all the fingers except for the thumb, which only has a proximal and distal phalanx. But again, very easy. The carpals are a little bit more difficult. And the reason why they're more difficult is because of their names, and they all don't look that much different from each other. But if you look at them, they're in two rows of four. They're sort of curved rows, but there's two rows of four. Well, what I'd like you to think about doing is numbering these in the rows of four. So we're going to do the proximal row first. One, two, three, four. And then we're going to name the others, but we're going to come back to the thumb, come back to the pollux, and then go five, six, seven, eight. If you do it correctly, one, two, three, four, four is going to look like a little P, like an English P. And then you go five, six, seven, eight, eight is going to have a hook on it. If you didn't get a little English P like thing and you don't get a hook, you didn't do it the right way. Well, again, their names are not easy. Here are their names. They're scaphoid, lunate, triquetral, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. And for most people, that's not very easy. And so I want you to learn this mnemonic. And a mnemonic is just a memory aid. And this mnemonic, what it is, is the first letter of every little part of this saying matches the first letter 
of the name of the carpal bone. So here's the mnemonic. It's Steve left the party to take Kathy home. Now it only works if you do it right. You have to do the proximal row and we're going to go thumb to little finger just like we did one, two, three, four. So Steve left the party is one, two, three, four and party is going to look like an little English P. And then to take Kathy home is going to be five, six, seven, eight. This is the distal row. We're going to start with the thumb and go to the little finger. To take Kathy home, home is going to have a hook on it. So if we look at it, it's going to look like this. So look at it. Steve left the party, party shaped like a P. To take Kathy home, home is going to have a hook on it. And then we're going to go back and we're going to use the real names. So instead of it being Steve left the party, we're going to say scaphoid, lunate, triquitral, Pisiform. And instead of to take Kathy home, we're going to say trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. So look, S, scaphoid, lunate, triquitral, pisiform. Remember, pisiform is P shaped, and that's what the word means. And then trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. Remember, hamate has a hook on it, and that's what the word means. So if we look at it here, we're always going to start with the thumb. We're always going to do the proximal row first. So scaphoid, lunate, triquitral, pisiform. Come back to the thumb, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate and ham eight. So that is the pectoral girdle and the upper appendage. And that's where this video is going to stop. There's already a quiz up for you to take it whenever you're ready.